We're here back in the NVIDIA GPU Technology Theater, sponsored by HP, and we are here now with Thomas Schultes from CSCS, and he's going to be speaking about Pizdame. Okay, so I'm uh, introducing uh, actually a, a not a new machine. The machine has been around for a year, uh, but it has been uh, finally built out, and uh, in this sense, it's a new machine uh, uh, that um, uh, is, is uh, now just about being all, uh, ready to be turned out to the users again. Before I get to the machine, I would like to talk about the context uh, that we are talking about here. About five years ago, we started with uh, an initiative to uh, put supercomputing back in shape in Switzerland. And so this started with the first investment into a Cray, uh, what turned out to be a Cray XE6 system uh, between 2009 and 2011. Uh, we had a program running for about three years that invested in application development. Uh, so we invested in about 13 application projects to make codes ready for future generation uh, uh, supercomputers and we even built a new data center between 2010 and 2011 and this whole effort now culminated in this development of Pit Stein, this new petascale supercomputer. So we really took a three-pronged approach uh, 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 starting with a new and efficient building uh, efficient machines and investments in applications. And now this whole thing is being turned over into a research infrastructure, so the investment in applications is continuing through something we call uh, a platform for advanced scientific computing, and here we will focus on co-design of applications and future uh, uh, computing systems, and then also uh, uh, renewed investments into the computing hardware starting off around in 2016. The science domains that we cover in uh, our user program and also on these machines uh, in um, around a hundred projects and a thousand users cover climate and meteorology, material science, chemistry, nanoscience, so everything to do with quantum uh, electronic structure, then life science and biome biomedical, uh, um, uh, geophysics or solid earth dynamics, uh, physics, and physics is both cosmology, astrophysics, and plasma physics for tokamaks, uh, and then fluid dynamics in engineering, that's still rather prominent, and the newest addition since about uh, a year is the, with the Human Brain Project, and since we are hosting the, the systems for the Human Brain Project, we also cover neuroscience or brain simulations. So now the over uh, to the machine, Pete Stein. Uh, so this gives you the context that we are operating in. The machine itself, the overarching goals was to build a machine where scientific productivity of the users was a top priority. And to us, as you heard, we invest in code development, so we are not interested in uh, limited to machines that can run old codes. We want codes to develop with the machines. So the most important thing there is to have a system where um, we have a programming environment that is compatible with what users use on their laptops or workstations where they do the developments on. Uh, so I'm really repeating this. This is, to us, is productivity. When somebody develops a code, comes to the supercomputer, and is not fighting with a compiler that is not capable of compiling modern code. Okay. Uh, then another important point was energy and cost efficiency. Uh, ETH received the funding from outside to buy the machine, but has to pay the power bill. So our CFO was very nervous about the projections for power consumption, and we, are, we have a good report part on, on efficiency, so they are happy with us now. Uh, then the size, it had to be, there was no ambition to make it one of the largest machines in the world, uh, the ambition was to have a system that is large enough so that our scientists can be competitive in science. So we estimated it has to be about a fifth or a quarter of the most performance systems in the world, measured by application performance, not HPL. 
performance. And um, the, but I also have to say the system is, is a research infrastructure, so it's open not just to Swiss scientists, but also uh, 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 good scientists from around the world. And the, the last point, and this was also important, is because we're also looking into the future, we want to motivate with this system, the right, give the right incentives for algorithmic improvements uh, uh, and software design for the future. And this is a lecture in itself. What are the right incentives? Uh, I just summarize with two bullets. We believe it's people have to develop algorithms that uh, maximize, that, that are very careful with data movements, so maximize data locality, expose parallelism both at the high level of methods and at the low level algorithms when you map the methods onto uh, uh, the, the hardware. So that was also a, a, a very important priority. And it turns out this last part here you can best do if you confront the users with a machine that has massive concurrency. And both in terms of uh, massive multi-threading on a node and thousands of nodes at least. Okay. Then we have to ma motivate uh, the data consideration and the way you do this today, the best way to do this is to have a uh, 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 hybrid uh, memory on a node, so a mixture of DDR and GDDR that are optimized for, for uh, uh, different things. So that meant whatever system we choose, we build, it has to allow, uh, 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 it has to be scalable and it has to allow upgradeability uh, uh, to hybrid multi-core nodes. At the time we made the decision, we did not know whether hybrid multi-core nodes are going to work. Okay. okay, so basically we can summarize the requirements. We had these four main requirements um, that I just talked about. And the solution, basically, you can now look at all the systems that are out there, uh, the, the, the intersection of all the capabilities that fit best on these requirements ended up being this KXE30 system, which is really the next generation uh, uh, interconnect, the ARIES interconnect um, we, and a much improved packaging technology. Uh, 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 it has, Cray has adopted this adaptive uh, strategy to support multiple node design. So that fitted us very well. We were very flexible on the node design and Cray of course is well known for very uh, performant compilers and since a few years since they start also supporting uh, x86 architectures um, uh, natively it also meant their compilers really became compatible with GCC that I run on my laptop. So the, the, um, now the, the x 30 from the build up uh, like every computer consists of blades. A blade has four nodes Every node has uh, uh, two sockets, and the last part you see here is this uh, ARI system on a chip uh, for the networking. Then uh, 16 of these blades form a chassis, and then six chassis in two cabinets form what is called an electrical group. And it's here that you can now understand the network. Um, so we have 16 chassis, each with four nodes, and in the first dimension, these 64 nodes are connected, interconnected with an all-to-all -to -all topology. And then the, the six chassis, uh, uh, blade one or blade zero in every chassis, again, are interconnected with an all-to-all. -all, and this is then the same for every other one, uh, um, uh, 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 blade. And finally, all the, the, these electrical groups are then interconnected with, uh, with an optical network again in an all-to-all -all fashion. And that's called this dragonfly topology. Um, and of course there's a paper at last year supercomputing that discusses this architecture. Now how did the uh, Pitt Stein uh, come about? We started off with uh, I think the first 12 cabinets that were 
delivered to a customer uh, a, a year ago, so in October, November, so before supercomputing last year, they were installed, 12 cabinets. Initially, um, just uh, Cray would only commit to three sets of four cabinets uh, because they had you know, had no time to really look at, uh, uh, you know, how they work together. But this was then done in a, in a collaboration within the next three or four months. And the idea was to not, uh, you can say, well, why don't you start just with one cabinet or two? From previous experience, w uh, since the network is so important, we decided we have to buy about half the size of the network and really scrutinize and test and, and have a lead time on the development also of application. So that's why we started with this a year ago. Then <coughs> we, uh, we went into a rigorous um, evaluation of various node designs. We started off with the default design, which is the dual Xeon. Uh, so the typical XE30 that you buy will have two Sandy Bridge or two Ivy Bridge processors per node. But because we had this philosophy to go into the direction of hybrid, uh, we, we had to look at the, the various options that we had with was Xeon, Xeon Phi and Xeon K20X. And so this was a, 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 a year-long project from December 2011 to November 2012 where we, uh, where we made the comparison and then ended up deciding for the Xeon uh, K20X combination. And, and the, the, the requirement was it had to beat the dual Xeon, otherwise it makes no sense to do hybrid. And it also, well, and it had to run real codes. And beat the dual Xeon means on real codes, not on DGEM, okay? Good. And um, we used then five applications for the design of the system. So uh, CP2K is a well-known chemistry code, COSMO is a climate code, a geophysics code, a molecular dynamics code, and the material science code, quantum espresso. Uh, we picked CP2K and COSMO, and they were then in the last one and a half years co-developed with the system. And so th we did not freeze the codes, we developed the codes along with the system, and, and it was really a collaboration with users, with NVIDIA, with Cray, and with um, uh, CSCS to, to develop this in the last 12 months. After we had decided we go with NVIDIA, then NVIDIA joined the collaboration. And uh, now we are just upgraded the system to these hybrid nodes and to 28 cabinets. Uh, and one thing I want we have a, 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 a hybrid system today. The codes are really optimized for both hybrid and just single, uh, simple multi-core system. And uh, so the, the blade before and after the upgrade, um, uh, the blade today consists, so what you see here is the Aries chip with four NICs connected to the nodes with a PCIe link. Um, and now the blade after the upgrade consists of a Sandy Bridge processor, 32 gigabytes of DDR3 RAM, and uh, NVIDIA GPU with six gigabytes of GDDR5 memory. And the total performance of a blade peak performance is 5.9 teraflops. Um, we have three ways that you can look at the machine as an application developers. Uh, you can, uh, uh, the, the, the typical hybrid configuration where an application would use both the CPU and the GPU and bo use both types of memory explicitly for the algorithms. The execution model is of course the same in all of them. The, the CPU is still a host, the, the GPU is an accelerator. But from a data point of view, we have three. We have the hybrid, we have uh, the, I mean, data and core algorithms point of view. Uh, we have hybrid, we have a distributed uh, multi-core system, so that would be this, or a distributed GPU system. And so of the codes we saw before, there are like the, the eigensolvers in Quantum Espresso um, or uh, um, CP2K, they would run in this truly hybrid mode. Cosmo 
the cli climate code would run either in this mode or in this mode. I guess you could make it hybrid as well. But it turned out the uh, energy to solution is so much better here that we just stick with this and don't go through the work of making it uh, truly hybrid. So now in the last um, <coughs> uh, five to ten minutes that remain, I will spend some time talking about an application. And I, I promised several. It turns out there's no way I can t cover more than one in this short time. Uh, I picked the climate code because we have most of the historic record on this code. Uh, the other codes, I can compare the code to a year ago or so, but I cannot compare to two or four years ago. So that's the reason I'm picking this for this presentation. So the code is used, uh, COSMO is used by our climate scientists at ETH Zurich uh, in, a, in a regional climate mode where they use a global model from ECMWF as boundary and initial conditions to drive a 12 kilometer resolution model and this then drives the two kilometer resolution model um, uh, uh, and I'm going to talk about the highest resolution because that's where all the the expensive work is. The same code is also used by uh, Meteo Swiss for the daily weather prediction. There, same global model, uh, seven kilometer European scale, um, uh, two kilometer Alpine scale. And the very specific problem, just to highlight why energy efficiency is, is important, is uh, today both climate and meteorology, they typically run one trajectory. What they should do in, project, in production is run 20 trajectories. Now you can build a machine that is 20 times larger and, and just, uh, yeah, just run 20 trajectories uh, on a larger machine and pay 20 times the power cost. Okay? And that turned out not to be a, a very good option. Um, <coughs> so that's why... Uh, I, you, you can approach this problem now in two ways. Okay, one way is to say, okay, we're at two kilometers resolution. We, we don't want one trajectory. Let's just go to lower resolution and do uh, uh, a, a much cheaper calculation more often instead of paying more power. And that, it, it turns out for, for if you want to predict the weather in Switzerland or study the climate is not a good option, but because you can see the orography, you don't resolve the, the, the important values that determine the climate over the country. So you will not predict the right storms up there, for example. Okay? So that is not an option. Then you have to keep the resolution. You have to run an ensemble and you don't want to pay more for power, you have to make things more efficient. And the way we approach this, and this is now prototypical for this application development program, so we had a number of other applications in other fields that did the same thing. So they went through an analysis of the code. They had, um, uh, uh, here is the, the percentage of lines of codes, and over there is the, uh, the, the part of the percentage of the runtime in the production mode. And so you can see about 20% uh, of the code uh, consumes about 60% of the time and another 20%, 20% over here of the time. So it was, after a long analysis, it was clear that they would have to rewrite the, the, the dynamics here in C++ was a decision based on pragmatic uh, a decision on how can you make a readable code that is optimal in terms of data management and, uh, uh, and, and performance. Um, the physics, this was another uh, uh, pragmatic decision, is the part of the code you don't want to change because a lot of model developers interface with this code part. And so there we just le left the Fortran code and we used um, OpenAP MP or OpenACC for the multi-threading part. <coughs> uh, then the, the implementation uh, 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 went along uh, since we have a low arithmetic density problem, we have to use bandwidth economically, uh, uh, therefore, you know, recompute rather than uh, uh, pre-compute, uh, because pre-compute you 
you you have to load store the parameters and you compete with the fields that you have to load store and um, uh, use flexible storage that can be adapted to the socket architecture whether you're on a CPU on a mic or on a, a GPU depending on the programming model to find the optimal data lay layout systematically minimize uh, uh, data movement through software managed caching and a lot more. So this would feel again a lecture on what you had to do. Uh, the, the software architecture, if I compare uh, the, begin the start, this is a simplified schema. Uh, we have a physics part, dynamics, we have a main code and as I said we replace the physics, we don't replace the physics, we just annotate it with OpenMP or OpenACC and on the side of the, um, uh, the dynamics there, they wrote a stencil library that lived on top of a number of other uh, domain specific libraries and the stencil library had then two backends one optimized for x86 and one optimized for GPU and this way the code is basically one source space supporting various architectures. The result of the whole uh, of everything and now I'm comparing how the code runs on this two kilometer model full you know end to end I, I'm not picking the pieces that run well, I'm using the whole simulation, run it on the machine that we had in November, in November 2011, KXE 6 in the old building. Uh, I run the same problem on the same number of nodes or same number of sockets on the XC30, I get a speed up of 1.35. This is the old code, old machine, old code, new machine, with dual uh, multi-core CPUs. Then I move to the new code. So that this difference, 1.35, you can understand from the difference between Sandy Bridge and, and um, Interlagos. It turns out just rewriting the software, and this was an already very optimized code, improved by another factor 1.4, 1.5. Moving the code to the GPUs gives you a factor 1.8 on the entire code. Again, we have only rewritten 20%, actually less than 20%. Um, uh, and uh, so, so, that, so that totals to a factor 3 in two, yeah, two years. Uh, the best machine we had in, in November 2011 and the best machine Pete Stein we have now. Okay? So that is an improvement. Uh, energy. So I do the same runs as before, same machines, but now I measure energy to solution. Not flops per watt or so, because I think that's the wrong thing to look at, but just look at energy to solution. The current code on, on Monte Rosa, on the XC6, and now you see the move to the, uh, uh, um, the XC30 is a factor 1.75, Time to solution would just be 1.35 and the difference you see here is the new packaging technology. Then you move to the new code, there you just see the improvement in time to solution, transitions to improvement in, uh, 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 in energy. Moving to the GPUs, that where you get the big advance, two, two and a half time, amounting to a total of almost a factor seven, improvement uh, energy to solution on a set problem. Now if you take the, on the same problem the, the PUE, the building, then you get the factor 1.10 and this breaks up into uh, the, the factors I just discussed. So the, the building is a one-time deal you get, you know, improvement in efficiency. I believe in the future where we have to continue to invest is in application code algorithms and in architectures on the node. That's, I think, where things need to go in the future. And I thank you for your attention. I just want to say in the end, I really thank a great team and collaboration with Cray, NVIDIA, and uh, two user teams uh, uh, to develop these systems, people at CSCS. Oak Ridge was very helpful because they s we used Titan as a, as a baseline. 
and uh, Steve Scott that I don't know where to put anymore after he moved. <laughs> I don't want to put Google because we really lost him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we, and then the, the people at CSES uh, who really did a great job. Okay. Well, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Do we have any questions here? There's a couple more minutes before we get ready for our next presenter. Any questions for Thomas? Yes, one. When you were evaluating to which system to choose, sorry, you, you've been evaluating for about a year. You said to which system to choose, yeah. And uh, were you using the downsizing the application and the system and uh, running on the, the the candidate system, or how did you do that? So we remember we had a, a program where we funded application development already. So we, and, and that program uh, uh, consisted of us funding people that would sit in the application team. Actually, the, the professors who developed the applications hire people with a strong HPC background. Okay? And then uh, the application suddenly is not just a million line of codes anymore, it's a set of algorithms. Okay? And with people who are very competent, which is these application teams that are now suddenly extremely good. So Olifuro for climate, I would say, is one of the best. And, and CP2K anyway, I think, is known as a code that does very well also on Titan. Then you can, you can uh, have a discourse and say, if we did this on the architecture, okay, work out what this means <coughs> for the application, not now, but how you would solve it. Okay, and that's how we did it in the end. I don't know if it answers the question. And hopefully <laughs> if you have some more information or questions that you wanted to share with Thomas, he'll be able to stand over to the side for a couple minutes maybe yeah. and further that. Thank you again for coming. You're welcome. Next, we're going to be having a, a presentation from Kelly Gaither from TAC. It's uh, regarding one of the announcements, actually, that was just made regarding Maverick. So come on back to the NVIDIA GPU Technology Theater in a couple of minutes and uh, see Kelly. <laughs>